High above the Mojave below soars a squadron of C-47 Skytrains, piercing through the inky black night en route to the frontier lands east of the Colorado River. Following the NCR's rousing victory at the Second Battle of Hoover Dam, the forces of Caesar's Legion are in a chaotic retreat seeking the relative safety of their remaining strongholds in their home territory of Arizona in the hopes of living to fight another day. General Oliver of the NCR, in a rare moment of tactical ingenuity, is determined to press home his advantage by encircling and destroying the Legion's remaining forces before they can escape, thus dramatically reducing the longevity of the war. To that end, he called on the Air Forces of the Republic to rapidly redeploy units via paradrop to sever the Legion's retreat vectors in an operation that would come to be known as the Meat Grinder. Howdy folks, Spy Dingo here. Obviously, Operation Meat Grinder isn't actually a thing, but I think it's a nice little scenario that the cargo plane from New Vegas could have feasibly been used for by the Republic. The reality of the cargo plane isn't nearly as sexy though. In fact, I was just minding my own business, searching Camp McCarran up and down for a flight of small jet planes that wasn't half buried in the desert sands when I found myself looking at a half a dozen massive cargo planes parked on the tarmac, some with wings extended and others with their wings folded up like a crane. And I thought to myself, huh, I'm not sure I've ever seen these before in my life. But that simply can't be. I mean, I've dumped 446 hours into New Vegas and gotten 75 of 75 achievements. Thus, the only rational conclusion is this. I, in my advanced years, completely forgot these beauties existed. I feel quite confident I'm not alone in this. So join me in rediscovering this airframe in a way that hopefully you won't soon forget. Fallout New Vegas' cargo plane wears its inspiration on its sleeve in the form of the Douglas C-47 Skytrain, a distinguished airframe that served in the Air Corps of the Allied Forces during the Second World War. The Skytrain, or Dakota, if you're of British persuasion, was a troop transport, cargo transport, and paratrooper insertion device designed for military service based off of the prolific civilian Douglas DC-3 airliner. Unlike her civilian counterpart, the Skytrain was fitted with a cargo door, a hoist, a reinforced floor, a shortened tail cone for facilitating the towing of gliders, and a scenic astrodome in the cabin roof for panoramic views and navigation. Having first flown in December of 1941, 10,000 units would be built and would serve in the United States Army Air Force, Royal Air Force, U.S. Navy, and in Lord Stanley's Royal Canadian Air Force, from the invasion of Sicily to D-Day to the Vietnam War, in what was truly a splendid career. The C-47 specs, and therefore most likely Fallout New Vegas' cargo plane specs, are as follows. She has a maximum airspeed of 224 miles per hour at an altitude of 10,000 feet with a service ceiling of 26,400 feet and a max range of 1,600 miles unless the Vegas plane features atomic powered Pratt & Whitney twin wasp engines rather than conventional power, in which case her range could be limitless. The Skytrain has a crew of four, a pilot, co-pilot, navigator, and radio operator, and a human cargo capacity of 28 fully kitted out soldiers. So space is at somewhat of a premium. So make sure to keep your ticket handy and ready to be punched, lest you be thrown out of the craft early. Finally, she should be approximately 17 feet tall, 64 feet wide, and boast a rather impressive wingspan of 96 feet. Now let us begin our pre-flight walk around and take note of the pros and cons of the New Vegas cargo planes design. Starting with the positives. The engine looks like, well, engines. The prop has the correct number of blades, three, and there are even exhaust manifolds to help sell the functionality aspect. Then there's the overall thickness and scale of the craft, a rarity in the Fallout universe. She is bulky in all of the right ways. Her wings are nice, thick, and juicy. You could just take a bite right out of them. While her landing gear is the meatiest piece of kit I think I've ever reviewed on this channel and even looks to be quite well articulated. The Vegas Skytrain also ranks among the best in control surfaces I've ever seen. 
with crystal clear ailerons on either wing, crisp looking elevators on the horizontal stabilizers of the tail, and a nicely ribbed rudder on the vertical stabilizer. All in all, this model looks to be refreshingly grounded in reality, at least aerodynamically, as there are certainly some usability concerns that we will discuss shortly. Indeed, the strong adherence to the model's historical basis is unquestionably the strongest aspect of this model, but also its weakest. Let me explain this contradiction as we transition into the cons I have with this flying craft. Look y'all, this is the Fallout universe. It's meant to be crazy. Filled with snarky robot scientists with monitors for eyes and mouths, death claws, and animatronic K9000 dog guns, not antique airframes from World War II. Don't get me wrong, I think the Douglas Skytrain is awesome, but I want to see the designer take the wild wasteland perk and really try something, you know what I mean? This level of adherence to the real world model, other than of course the inclusion of the bizarre foldable swan wings, is quite disappointing to me in the same way that the shooting star is. Though I certainly do find it far more understandable in the case of Obsidian's New Vegas, given its laughably short development time. The historical nature of the craft also brings up some seriously difficult to answer questions, namely that of why the heck I repeat, why the heck would a 1940s airframe STILL be in service with the US military, judging from the military green paint job, the eight or so examples parked at McCarran are rocking, and the fact they're parked at McCarran, over 130 years later? I mean, this thing is way past being called an antique, so it's really, really hard to go with the standard justification I would have of resource shortages have caused the military to have to dig extremely deep into their mothballs and press these cargo aircraft back into service. But even if you do accept that as a reasonable explanation and you believe that there would be a stock of these airframes after 130 years in mothballs, I just can't imagine it would be more efficient to reactivate these craft in comparison to simply breaking them down for their materials and then recycling them into at least a slightly more modernized craft. So just why? Why would these be used? I'm honestly completely at a loss. How about you? I'm equally confused by the swan wing foldable design as well, although I do actually really think it looks quite neat. But why though? I mean, Camp McCarran is literally in the middle of a freaking desert, the Mojave in fact. So it's not like space was at a premium necessitating the development of such a feature. The only context I can think of, in universe anyways, is that of the New Vegas Skytrain being a generalized cargo craft capable of serving in both the Army and the Navy, let's say. Like the F-35, a one size, although there are technically three different variants of the F-35, fits all solution for all the branches of the military. Thus, the New Vegas Skytrain could be deployed to aircraft carriers, and that would require such a space-saving feature. That could justify its existence, even though the craft we see in the desert absolutely does not justify it in any way. I still feel like this explanation is rather hand-wavy indeed, but hey, at least it's something. Now we get to the far, far less thought-provoking cons I see with this design. The first of which will not surprise you in the slightest if you happen to have watched the video I did covering the New Vegas jet plane. And that is the fact this troop transport has exactly zero doors, although it does have several windows. So who knows, maybe those roll up and the men shove their equipment and themselves through them, but I highly doubt that. Next, although the landing gear is quite sturdy, as previously mentioned, the frontal landing gear doesn't actually have anywhere to be retracted into, which is certainly a blow in efficiency that the historical model doesn't share. Similarly, the New Vegas Skytrain features an oddly for lack of a better word, rib design that can't be particularly great for aerodynamics. Although I must admit, it is quite visually striking. Finally, I'll admit this isn't much of a con and is much more of a general open question to you fine folks. What exactly is the purpose of the pod-like device on either wing outboard of the engines? I honestly can't think of a thing that could be for. So I look forward to learning from y'all in the comments. Well, that'll close the chapter on this one, folks. Thank you so much for watching. I look forward to seeing you on the next one. I have no idea what that's going to be at this point. Not going to lie. Hopefully, it will be something Starfield related. But that would make me have to actually, you know, stop playing the game to make a video. So who knows? 
Special thanks to all of my subscribers and my wonderful channel members for helping make this all possible. Spy Dingo out.